back to the Kentucky Bourbon Festival 2020 virtual edition. I'm here this afternoon with a couple of guests. We're going to talk about Rick Houses, Donald Blinko of Music Construction, and Bob Cutter of Cutter Construction. If you don't get the idea of construction, we're talking about people who build things, especially Rick Houses and the things that lie within them. Rick Houses too often don't get enough credit for what they do to the whiskey within them. Do you agree? 100%. Yeah, 100%. So, we want to talk about their impact on the whiskey that's aging inside. I mean, it's one thing to make a great distill, it's another thing to make a great barrel, but then they have to spend most of their lives, in fact, the bulk of their lives, probably 90% of their lives, 95, outside in a rickhouse aging. And we want to talk about why that building is so important to the final product. So, um, I mean, these things are all over the landscape here in Kentucky. Does anybody have any idea how many Rick houses are in Kentucky? You're probably beyond your count, right, Donald? I think I've heard something, maybe 200 or so. There's a lot of them. So uh, even if you did the low end at 22,000 yeah. barrels in, you know, 200 Rick houses, that's a lot of barrels. Anybody at home doing the math? Because I'm not. This is why I'm a, a writer. Well, there's two <laughs> barrels for every, every Kentuckian in the state, right? That's Something right. Like that. That's right. Yes. Too bad we can't yeah. claim that on our taxes. You know, you <laughs> do it, get a refund for that. <laughs> so, so Donald, um, how many are you guys contributing to that mass every year? Well, we build several. We build for a lot of the big distillers um, in the state. We actually go out of the state a little bit as well. Um, I bet we've been averaging well over a million barrel spaces the last few years. So if you divide that by the big ones, that's 200 yeah, brick houses, it might be right? too, yeah. I've heard around 200, something like that. So what is your company's contribution to that lot? Ooh, we've been around since 1937. They've been building them since before I was born. I can't tell you how many we've built. I know we're building a lot uh, in the last several years. I mean, we're probably doing over 500,000 barrel spaces a year for the last couple of years. That amounts to how many brick houses? 200? Uh -huh. I don't know if we built not, quite not 200. I'm sorry, 20? Yeah. Yeah, we've probably done well over 20 warehouses. Not per year, but somewhere close to that maybe per so year. So talk about some of the monsters that you're putting up, like at Buffalo Trace, those are 58,000 barrel rick houses. Yeah, your bigger distilleries, they're trying to get like barrels per acre now. Um, the biggest <laughs> one's 58,800 barrels that we build. Um, you know, we've kind of worked with the Kentucky Building Code to size these buildings. It's, it's a unique type of building in the whole uh, United States. and. Um, kind of that, that's as big as we can go that they want to put guess all your eggs in one basket kind of thing and then you kind of space them out i mean the heaven hill fire kind of taught everybody a lot of lessons and uh try to learn from things they did wrong in the past to do it better today so it, it confirms this is correct but i've been told on buffalo trace tours that some of those rick houses that hold fifty-eight thousand barrels by the way it's 500 gallons of whiskey per barrel that they cost set I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why did I say 500,000? Yeah, oh my gosh, 50, 50 53 30. gallons, yeah. that's right, per barrel. Goodness. <laughs> and these things cost $7 million to build, but $21 million to fill for the, for the liquor and the uh, wood. Yeah, it's, I've heard the barrels are more expensive than the building, plus whatever it costs to, to distill the bourbon. It's a lot of money. And these things are going up, one of those every four months at Buffalo Trace, right? Yeah, they're going up fast. And yeah. you're putting up about the same speed at Heaven Hill. Some of those, they're, they're smaller at 56,000 barrels. Yeah, right? Heaven Hill's got a little difference on theirs. They like to do a little different, takes up some of the square footage, but it's about the same size building, really. Jeez, uh, that's yeah. just crazy. The whole industry's growing like crazy. It is, I mean, people joke that music is the busiest business in the distilling industry. Is that fairly true? We've got a lot of great employees. I know we've grown along with industry and try to keep our quality and uh, take care of our customers. Now, Bob, you guys do a lot of repairs in rick houses. I mean, so you're doing some buildings. That's correct. You're getting into that, but talk, talk about the things that that create some of the needs for repairs. I mean, yeah. Well, first, I'm just honored to be here with with Donald and and you guys, and obviously they're the legends in the uh, in the rick house business. And uh, yeah, we got involved with mostly our, our safety division in going in and doing some repairs of uh, walk boards and. Uh, post and dunnage and a lot of that was from the powder post beetle and, and some of those issues. Talk so, about that some because that's is that a fairly recent thing maybe the last 20 years that powder post beetles have been eating away at the structures? Is that, is that right? 
it seems to be, and you know, you, you've been in the business longer than I have, but they uh, seem to be mostly in the last 20 some odd years. And there's probably different reasons from that. You know, some of the warehouses sitting empty. Uh, during the slump, I during, guess. During the yeah. slump and, you know, moisture in the warehouses, some of them sitting empty, the windows closed up and just made a great environment. High moisture is a, is a great environment for the powder post beetle. That's right, because the wood is a little bit more edible at that point, right? It's a little softer for those bugs to chew on it, I suppose. Just just seems to be a good environment for them I, to be I, in. I think you did an interview with Bernie Lovers where you're talking about that, that airflow is so crucial in those warehouses to dry that wood out and, and, and make the environment not so good for the beetle. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, moist wood is, just like Bob said, he's on point there they just like a softer wood probably because it is e easier to eat i don't know the science behind it but um it's been like in the last 20 years that you've seen this issue i know i've talked in our office people been around forever they didn't really even know what that was um you know and they did cover up windows kind of cut off airflow and wood does better when it's dry it's stronger and keeps the insects out so one of your partners in the business with with heaven hill they talk about the new rick houses that were built out on cox creek which is at Barstown Road just before you get to Barstown, that the circulation is so good that not only is it improving the whiskey, but they're really happy with, you know, like you said, the better conditioning for the woods. So talk about maybe some of the modern advances in rick houses that have allowed for that better circulation as opposed to the ones maybe that are on their other sites, their historic sites. What have you done differently? I guess is a better question. The as far as the building itself, it's relatively the same. We've got a lot of engineering behind it, how to brace it, but it's speaking specifically to the airflow. I think what's really good about Cox's Creek is they're, you know, they're up on a hill. It's just that area has naturally got a lot of wind going through it. And you know, they've, they've been building these buildings this way for decades. They all have a lot of windows where you can open the windows, get the airflow going through. Um, you know, you can see, look in here, there's <laughs> catwalks everywhere, you know, open air spaces. Every barrel gets quite a bit of, uh, air around it kind of helps the thermodynamics um, you know the structure out there is not so much different as what they built even a hundred years ago and I think they understood back then too you'll see a lot of your older warehouses are up on hills you know you put them down in a valley or something down against a tree line where they can't get the airflow I mean it's it's really as simple as that you got to have airflow to make the thermodynamics now Mike Sani over at uh, Heaven Hill had said that those wonderful rick houses over at Dietzville that were built in the late 40s mm -hmm. by was it T.W. Samuels story are positioned exactly the way you want them to the winds, but it also makes them susceptible to abuse from the winds. Are the roof designs different yeah. these days? Or to, to, because he said you can peel it back in a storm sometimes, that metal that's on the roof. Yeah, you got to um, design to the building codes. I mean, they dictate kind of wind speeds and that kind of thing. I mean, we use hurricane clips and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it used to be on an old warehouse, they would do a tar roof. I don't know why they did that, but after the Heaven Hill fire, that's one thing they actually got put in the building code was that you have to have a class A fire rated roof on them. Because I remember my father was actually out there when the Heaven Hill fire went on watching it and you would start seeing white smoke billowing on the tar roof. And they say, well, that's barely catch fire and poof, that roof and then that warehouse was gone. So that's about the main thing that's different is they don't do tar roofs anymore. Yeah, and one, yeah, you got the benefit of the winds for the, for the circulation and, and the maturation of the, the bourbon, but you also got just, you also got it from a structural standpoint of, of you know, building them to where that they can withstand that. So, Which, so I, ideally, they're breathing from the bottom. It's almost a convection flow through those things, right? So, so do, are they open at the bottom somehow, or? Well, we put foundation vents in there, and then you know, your windows, and there's different theories of which windows to open and when to open them. But yeah, I mean, just from uh, where hot air rises, you know, your heat, at least in the summer wise, is going to go up through the roof. Some distilleries don't want any ridge venting; they want to hold as much heat in there and try to make that magic happen that way. Others want a lot of ridge venting to make more air. So, you know, that's really up to them to see whose science is right. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing to me, all the, every distiller is a little bit different. And even one distillery may have two different brands and one brand may have the windows open 24 seven for, for all year. The other, another brand from the same distiller will, will close half the windows in an open deal you know, for half the year. So they all have their own little unique way, but I think the airflow does contribute to that and it changes the taste of the bourbon. So they've all got their own unique character. And, and even to the point we were talking earlier about the palletized warehouses where you're stacking them on the head and you don't have near the airflow that you do 
with with the other so so they've all got to, a different to give a, an idea of what we're talking about these are racks or ricks whatever you want to call them and they're on the sides and you can see the spaces between them bob's talking about a palletized situation where the barrels are stacked on a pallet six or nine it's not there's nine, nine on the pallet. pallet and they stack the pallets on top of each other so these barrels abut each other and don't get quite the circulation but in some cases i've seen forced air circulation mm -hmm. to to manage that that's expensive too yeah got to costs uh every month with uh, heating bills this is just kind of that's kentucky's natural environment everybody talks about the limestone water and it was great here at the time but also we get true seasons i think that's kind of you know not given the due diligence or is what makes kentucky bourbon so great do you are you talking about the true seasons do, do any of those seasons give you guys headaches in terms of construction is, is it one harder <laughs> on the other say, oh there's a laugh i'd say it's winter of yeah. course yeah you can't do site work in the winter it's hard yeah. to anyway no i mean the actual structure does it have to endure one season over the other I mean, is, 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 is winter harder than summer or is it just the same to the structure it doesn't care i wouldn't think the structure yeah. cares once you get them built then it doesn't matter one thing that we are doing with with our new system is we're assembling it in a warehouse, so it's pre-assembled, and then we ship it out on a truck. These are your K-Racks, right? Your, your the K-Rack system, it's, it's pre-assembled. We're using uh, glue lamb, laminated wood that is heat treated and pressure treated, so that does kind of help with the powder post beetles also. Uh, but we'll be able to assemble that, so we, we're doing most of it in interior in an in a assembly plant, and it requires less, less people in the field less workers in the field. So, talk, but talk, so you guys are still building them there in the field, but it wasn't that long ago that they were hauling the wood up floor by floor by floor in a distillery and, and assembling the rick there. Were you alive when that was going on? <laughs> no, I wasn't alive when, well, I probably <laughs> was, but I don't remember it at all. My father worked out at, uh, you know, in the field doing that kind of thing. And he finally came up with, there's gotta be a better way. And he worked with some of our uh, Cruise, I think Bailey Pressgrove was one of the main ones that kind of helped develop this kind of jig trailer that we've uh, developed, and it, it just helps keep quality control and So talk about what's happening versus hauling lumber up the <laughs> stairs. No. What, what's happening on the ground now when you're building that room? Yeah, we try to take advantage of all the equipment and technology we have today. We, we basically got a trailer with uh, basically a, a jig on it. We stack all the posts and dunnage and everything, which dunnage are your beams the barrels lay on, and we build a rick right on the ground so it's safer and, you know, the, the jig is all plumb and true so everything's uh, right. Because, you know, if you start getting these things leaning, you build seven stories on top of them, you have some major trouble. And then they just take a crane and pick that whole rick up and set it in place and kind of build it out like that. I think we've sometimes gotten 100 ricks in a day set up there so they can go pretty fast with it. Oh, my gosh. How long does it take to build one of those monster rick houses? And we've, one of our clients pushed us to do it in about three months, but we've had two <laughs> crews on there like that. I like to take about seven months if possible. That's more <laughs> kind of without burning my guys out. So, yeah. For five generations, over 100 years, our family-owned company has sourced quality white oak for staves and cooperage. Our craftsmen and women are the heart of independent stave company. Their skills, paired with equipment designed by our own engineers, shape the staves into barrels, ensuring quality at every step. We partner with distillers to find the perfect toast and char recipe that will develop specific flavors while aging their unique spirit. From our classic charred barrel to our innovative small batch series, ISC builds custom barrel programs for distillers who craft the world's finest spirits. We are more than just a general contractor. From land acquisition and development to self-performing trades like design and engineering, site, concrete, masonry, steel fabrication, steel erection and hardscapes, building repairs and maintenance, warehouse remediation, fall protection inspections and installations, and K-Rack's Premium Spirits Barrel Storage Systems. We work together. Four divisions, three generations, one team. We are Cutter. Well, so let's talk about how these good rickhouses affect the, the whiskey. I mean, it, we're talking about airflow. You know, some of these rickhouses are clad in brick, some in concrete, some just in ordinary metal, like this one that we're here at Barstown Bourbon Company with. 
T talk, talk about how that affects the whiskey inside. Well, I'm assuming the, the metal, you know, and a lot of them are darker colors to kind of create, to generate some more heat, to take advantage of the solar system. And uh, something, well, then they go with some of them that are insulated to hold the heat and actually put heat in them. Uh, as far as the masonry and, and the other factors, some of that, I think, is just aesthetics. Yeah, it probably is. Yeah, and I don't know back in the, whenever they built the big expensive concrete brick ones, I mean, man, I hate to think what that would cost today, but um, I, I don't know really why they, some of the stuff they did back in the day, I can't explain why they did it, but um, most all today, it's kind of just metal skin. They kind of want as much thermal dynamics as they can. And I did want to touch, you mentioned the ones out in uh, Deetsville. I believe they're kind of turned uh, north to south too. So I think I've read kind of the old timers liked to have the orientation right up on a hill and oriented north to south so they get kind of the, the sun beats on that metal as long as it can all day and kind of really heats that thing up. So the thermodynamics are, it's what it's all about. If any of you have ever seen the Rick Houses at Deetsville, they're on Highway 245 on the way in. You want to turn onto the Deetsville Loop and you'll come back around to 245 in just about a mile's span. But these are, I know they were not rare for the time, but they are steepled Rick Houses. I don't think any exist anymore, do they, other than those? Mm -hmm. I've not seen them. But they're really unique, and apparently they were Parker Beam's favorite. You know, what whiskey came out of there, I'm not certain, but he <laughs> loved them. But, t but according to Bill Samuels, Sr., who's the um, chairman of Maker's Mark, he would say that, you know, Dad thought that it did a better job of moving convection or convecting air through the Rick House. And I said, did it work? He said, hell no. <laughs> he, he said, as far as Dad could tell, no, it didn't have any impact on him. So... Did you get, did maybe your dad's company get away from that design because it was a little bit complicated, I guess, versus just the straight up and barely arched design now? Just simpler to build those? I can't, I don't know the history of that. I know it's, you know, your cost per barrel of construction, anything, anytime something is simpler, it's usually less expensive. And that's what most people, you know, like as long as it works. And, um, they don't have, you now the bigger houses, at some point they're, you know, you, the smaller the house, I'd say you probably get a little bit more thermodynamics, but the distilleries have all kind of done their homework on, you know, what's a sweet spot for that. So again, back to the whiskey, what is it doing when the airflow is so good in that whiskey? Does it make it more consistent from top to bottom? I, I got to think it kind of goes in and out of the barrel more. I mean, yeah. it's the, it's the char on the wood and how it interacts uh, with that, you know, is what I think, Bob. Yeah. I mean, what I've heard, you need a master distiller here to tell you that, yeah. these two construction guys, <laughs> yeah. but the, uh, what I've heard is it pulls the, you know, the, the, uh, the angel share out, it's pulling it out through the wood and, uh, and then allowing that liquid to go back in. So it's, it's pulling it into the wood and back in, or back and forth. So it's when you have better air circulation, do you have a little bit less uh, variance in the temperature from the top to bottom, or is that always just gonna be low and wonderful climb it down the bottom and really satanic hot up top. Is that just going to be the way it is with most Rick houses? Well, I would speculate if you had enough air movement, you could probably get one zone. But it, if, if you move too much air, you start drying the wood out too much, you'll start losing more angel share is what you'll start getting. So there's kind of a sweet spot there. So if you can let natural ventilation happen is what I see most of them do. And when you do that, you kind of get a heat sink with so much volume that it's kind of hard to, it doesn't just change like uh, you know, in an instant. So if you ever, I'm sure you've been in Rick houses, the first mm -hmm. floor, if it's super hot outside, the first floor is cooler usually, but then you go up to the top and it's uh, a lot hotter. So you get about every two floors, you'll get a different environment in a Rick house. I, I think that kind of lends itself to different products. Like you mentioned earlier, Steve, you know, you can, the, the way they age differently, it's, it has a big difference on the taste. Yeah. Some of those will have, the distillers will have their premium brands kind of in the middle middle areas of those uh, floors. And then the others, they'll, they'll do a lot more blending now, I think, than they did you know, kind 80 of, kind years of cross ago. section, you know, to, to draw their batch from maybe, I yeah. guess, sometimes. Do they ever tell you that, 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 that you know, that one up top's gonna be XYZ brand? Or, I don't no. know that I know that for sure. I've, I've, I'm like Bob, I've heard the same thing about some say the middle of it's the sweet spot, but I'm, everybody's got different tastes and different, that's what's good about this is you can, in the Rick house, you get a lot of different flavors and find something for everybody. Well, you had mentioned the Heaven Hill Fire of 1996. What, what other safety advances have been pioneered since then? 
Uh, from what I see, you get a, the sprinklers have become a big thing. Uh, you're separating them out and berming them a lot more so that hopefully if one does. Talk about that. So separating each house separately and berming them with dirt? Yeah, I guess. dirt mainly. So occasionally we'll do concrete walls or, you know, basically, you know, sometimes it's just it's a ditch. Um, you know, the, we work with the insurance companies too. You know, they do studies about find what's best practices, but basically just trying to build them such that if, you know, Lord forbid lightning strikes a house, uh, that you're only going to lose that one. Where Heaven Hill lost six or seven, seven. in a distillery. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they didn't have near the berming and Nobody went through that before, so it's kind of lessons learned. And I think now, uh, within the berms where you have those uh, areas where the, where the whiskey can flow, don't they have, I think, uh, cutoffs? Like where the whiskey can go in, that maybe a channel that, that or, ordinary water would go through. There's a wax uh, barrier of some sort. What's that? Melts it. Yeah, fuse link. Yeah, right they've got little valves on there that if it's on fire, it goes through. And some of them put... Uh, actuated valves or uh, you know, manual valves on the back for a safety measure and um, we're even getting now into some where you're kind of tying in alarm systems into the valve to shut it um, so uh, yeah we kind of after the Heaven Hill fire when this business started really booming you know the Kentucky Distillers Association put all their members in kind of we were involved with it and kind of helped write a section of the building code and worked with the state building officials who's always been great and got everybody's the public's best interest in mind and kind of came up with um, some means and methods to try to never have a heaven hill fire get out of control like that again now i understand that cox creek you the, i don't know if you did it but that is a dry pump system to where if there were a fire that these diesel pumps kick on and push three hundred thirty thousand gallons worth of water into the buildings is that unusual or is that pretty common now um, most of the warehouses have dry systems because, uh, and by that means these pipes, uh, you probably can't see it in your video here, but there's sprinkler pipes here, they're dry. If you had water in here and you got a really cold winter because this house is not insulated or heated, theoretically that could freeze and you can imagine that would be bad. So um, they're just full of air and if uh, one trips, the air bleeds out and the water floods in there. Um, anywhere where you maybe heat, keep your house heated and you won't see uh, potential freezing situations, a uh, uh, wet system's a little less expensive to put in, but that gets offset by insulating and, and heating the house too. So yeah. is, is there any particular science that's on the forefront of the next Rick houses you guys are gonna build? Anything you're waiting to do that some you would tell a distiller, this is the next great idea, you wanna do it? Or is it just the same old, same old successful system? I know Bobby, you all have been working on some stuff. I'll let you answer that first. Yeah. we've. We've designed a couple of different systems from uh, really more of an engineered wood that, like I say, it's, it's uh, not susceptible to the powder post beetle. Structurally, we've got some safety fall protections in, in your uh, walkways. Trying to, and that was some of the issues we ran into in the remediation piece was opportunities for injuries. And we were, we were looking for ways to change that not so much for the aging of of the bourbon but structural of the building of the house itself the other thing that we've to really subsidize for the palletized barrels we've got a portable rack system that will hold we got a six pack and a 12 pack that you can move with a forklift you can actually roll the barrels in they look just like just these look just like here. this uh -huh. these racks and they stack on top of each other up to four high and you can actually load them in a semi. So you could load them at the barreling plant right out of the, right out of the, load them into the barrel, put them in the racks, put them on a semi, oh my. take them to a plant, one of the old warehouses that maybe just a, just a metal building or precast building and stack them in there. But it's got more airflow. They're not stacked vertically, they're stacked horizontally, right. which seems to be a more preferred way to age the bourbon, age the whiskey and then uh, stack those up to four high. You could even, and we do that partially for not just the bourbon industry, but also the winery for the wine industry. So your little boutiques, you know, maybe not your big big guys, but your small guys that are, that are batching, you know, five, 10 barrels a week, you know, that's easy for them to use that far. So that's, a, that's kind of a different market. And then, like I said, the wine industry is, is another area that uses a lot of these barrels. And you know you're getting into the craft beers now too, so another way of just just storing barrels and aging aging spirits. 
Anything for you on the horizon? Um, we are always looking for safety. I mean, safety first and trying to get, uh, just make it more safe for people to work it in and for us to build the buildings. You know, it's um, a lot of people that go to do that. Um, you know, I say everybody tries to reinvent the wheel a lot. Uh, the, the people have been making bourbon for 200 years and they kind of know what works and it has worked. And you're always looking for ways to do better, but we find that these buildings we've been building, uh, the one thing was the powder post beetles maybe, but we've kind of gone and worked with a lot of distillers. They have borate products you can treat your wood with. And I really feel a lot of that issue has been uh, lack of airflow and getting the moisture in the wood. So we kind of really try to preach We've kind of went to like an, back to an awning style window where they can keep that open and let the air get in, but not the rain. And we're always working with our partners to do bigger and better things. But um, when something works, you also, you kind of stick with it too. And, and it sounds like that the improvements that 95% of what works, works. And you're down at that last 5%. Is that pretty safe to say? Yeah. It's just I think so. And, point. And Safety, the, which is important. Labor is yeah. really important. Yeah, that's amazing to put a, a, a rack on a on a truck and send it over loaded with barrels. That, yeah, and then when you get done, put it back on the truck, and take it to the bottling plant, and, and empty it out. Yeah. But uh, the other thing that I've always found interesting with the the distilleries and the bourbon industry is just the way they 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 play together. Uh, you know, we we deal with manufacturing, retail, and other markets, but the bourbon industry and the distilleries they work together, they play together in the same sandbox so well. And I think they help educate and teach each other. I mean, we've, we've been to several uh, and done some seminars with one distillery that says, here, I wanna share our ideas, here's what we're doing. And they bring four or five other distillers in and say, here's what we're doing and share that information. So I think it's being able to, to work with other industries and work with other people to, to, to educate. We can always learn every day we learn something new it's a good business i've, I've written about a lot of them <laughs> uh over the years and few have as few egos as this business does i think yeah, yeah. I, you know, I would echo that there's just a lot of great people in the bourbon industry i've worked around other industries as well it's a lot more cutthroat i, I think that a lot of people just believe as bourbon grows all the distilleries will grow so they kind of help each other to make bourbon you know just a better subset of uh of spirits and that's why we have a festival every year even a virtual festival. <laughs> we thank you so much for joining us. This chat with these guys, Donald, Bob, thanks so much for sharing a little bit of your inside information about Rick Houses. You're welcome. Sit with us, sip with us, and stay tuned for the next program.